Okay. Now, you know sometimes we've, we've talked before about the um, my experience as a detective and my experience as a police officer has led me to the conclusion that there are basically um, three reasons, three, um, uh, three motives that cause anybody to commit a crime. And as working, you know, working homicides like I do, I can tell you that every homicide I've ever worked comes down to these three motives. If you're somebody who has been listening to our website, uh, to our podcast rather, for a, a period of time, then you already know what I'm talking about. You know where I'm going. I've podcast on this before. Uh, three motives that can destroy the truth. Um, I've podcast on this a number of different times in a number of different areas. But I think that you need to understand this before we begin, uh, that all crimes, even from simple thefts to the most gruesome of homicides, they're all motivated by one of three evil desires. Here they are. Sexual lust, financial greed, and the pursuit of power. Now, Mormonism hinges on the truth claims of Joseph Smith, right? I mean, if he's telling the truth, Mormonism is the restoration of Christianity. If he's lying, Mormonism is simply another man-made religious system and is of no more value than any other false religion. So we have to examine, I think, Joseph Smith and examine his motives extremely carefully. Did he have a good reason to lie? Now, I can tell you when I'm doing interviews with people, did you do that? They'll sometimes uh, try to, con to convince me uh, without answering the question. You know, the real first question answers quite simply, right? Yes or no. Did you do that? No, I didn't do that. And instead they'll say something like, well, why would I do something like that? What possible reason would I have to do something like that? This kind of evasion is very simple. It's easy to see when you're looking at the statements forensically. And it's easy to see while you're in the midst of the interview. But we have to look at Joseph and, and say and ask ourselves, did he have a reason? Were any of the three desires that I just gave you, those three motives, sexual lust, financial greed, pursuit of power, were any of those three desires motivating Joseph? Now, as it turns out, Joseph benefited from the creation of Mormonism in ways that could, in fact, have been his motive for recreating a religion in the first place and for lying about it along the way. Let's take a look at the three motives and see what, how it might be that Joseph benefited in those three areas. First, sexual lust. As, you know, as a result of, of what Joseph Smith did in creating Mormonism, Joseph was able eventually to justify uh, his polygamous sexual activity. Now, it's widely known that he did not authorize this as being God-ordained until he was caught after the fact in his first uh, affair. But eventually, Joseph took over 30 wives for himself. Now, many of these wives were underage. Many of these wives were already married to somebody else. And they had spiritual marriages, spiritual marriages, with Joseph. And, God, and, he, and Joseph argued that, that God had revealed polygamy as a holy practice, which ordained this. Now, Emma, his first wife, trust me, was not uh, all that happy about it. You could see, even in reading Joseph's writings in the Doctrines and Covenants, that he's working on overtime to try to make her understand that God has ordained this. Because Emma was furious about it. She never completely accepted what Joseph was claiming about polygamy. He, she never fully accepted that he was telling the truth about God's approval. When, when the church, uh, when and Joseph was killed and she uh, separated from the church and became part of, a, of an offshoot of Mormonism, they denied this polygamy issue altogether. So right away from the very beginning, you can, it's clear that Emma was never a fan of this. Now, now many of the founding members of Mormonism, they actually left the group when Smith started the practice of um, polygamy. But, but Joseph claimed that polygamy was God-ordained, and so the creation of Mormonism allowed him to pursue his sexual lust. Is that in and of itself a reason to call it a lie? No, of course not. It's one piece of a circumstantial puzzle. It certainly provides us with one possible motive for why Joseph might do this. The second issue we talk about in terms of motive is, is financial greed. And, and as the prophet of this new religious system, Joseph Smith, you know, he, he had to rely and did rely largely on the support of his followers. He repeatedly um, went to them for financial support, um, uh, and, and he sought the support of members of the church who, who worked in one field or worked in another field. And over the years, even while Joseph Smith lived in the, within the group, hundreds of members contributed to whatever project Joseph deemed necessary. 
And Smith actually wrote that the prophet should be sustained by his people. At one early point in Mormon history, Smith claimed to have a revelation from God to establish a bank in Kirkland, Ohio. Now, he became the cashier for the bank, which, by the way, was never licensed by the state of Ohio, and he told his followers that God promised him the bank would never fail. Now, ultimately, of course, it did fail, and it bankrupted many members of the church who placed their trust in Joseph and lost everything they had. And these folks ultimately walked away from Mormonism. The issue of financial greed, while I'm sure that the members of the church would not like to think this is possible, is a good motive here because we saw how it was that Mormonism benefited Joseph. Now, of course, you could argue, well, geez, he died as a result of his efforts. Well, you know, bank robbers sometimes get killed as a result of robbing banks. But the fact that he died at the end of his pursuit does not mean that pursuit itself was not driven by financial greed. Uh, the last thing, of course, is the pursuit of power. And, and remember that Joseph Smith, he acted as the singular spokesperson for God himself. He claimed to be the prophet of God. He initiated all the activity within the Mormon community. And, and he did so by simply claiming that God directed the activity. So whatever he wanted, he would claim that God had told him needed to be done. His personal power, his personal influence, it was staggering, especially considering that the number of times he tested the will of his people. He stretched them and pushed them to the limit. His followers grew in number. They gave him a power base that was possessed by few others in the time in which Joseph lived. In, 19, in 1843, Joseph even announced his candidacy for the presidency of the United States. And I don't know if you know this or not, but in 1844, he organized a secret Council of Fifty. See, Smith was trying to establish what he called a theodemocracy. And this council was to act as a uh, policy-making body, basically a, 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 a group of, of individuals who would make policy for the new government. Smith even used the council to send ambassadors to England, to, to, to France, to Russia, uh, down to the Republic of Texas. Uh, the, the, this council immediately ordained Joseph as king of the kingdom of God. And Joseph Smith predicted that the United States would be overthrown in just a few years. Now look, as you examine the truth claims of Joseph Smith with me in the next two podcasts, and the truth claims of the Book of Mormon, I think we've got to realize, and we've got to recognize before we even begin, that Smith clearly had something to gain by fabricating all this. Now, do the motives themselves, you know, in and of themselves, prove that Joseph Smith did in fact lie about the Book of Mormon? I would say no. They don't. We need to continue to examine all the evidence. But if I'm making a case in front of a jury, and they're going to ask not only what happened, but why? Why would he do this? Why would the suspect kill that woman? Why would, you know, why? They want to know. And I think you've got enough reason here, the three motives we talked about, th enough reason here to argue for this. To argue that it's possible, at least, that there was enough motive for Joseph to do what he did and to lie about doing it. Now, we're going to take a look and, and as we go forward, uh, just at all the evidence piece by piece. But this is a good thing, I think, to stop right here at this point and just contemplate the, the idea of motive. Because this same idea has sometimes been argued about the apostles of Christianity. They were motivated. They've had reason to do it. Well, did they have reason to, to lie about Christianity? Did they have a financial gain that came out of this? Did, did Paul become a rich man? Did Peter become a rich man? Uh, the power that they gained out of it, they couldn't even stay in one place long enough. Uh, you could argue that Peter and Paul uh, had power in Rome. How would you argue for the other uh, uh, ten? How would you argue for those other eyewitnesses who died a martyr's death along the way to, to make a claim about the truth? And they died that martyr's death without becoming, uh, you know, without satisfying any a sense of sexual lust, without satisfying any sense of financial greed, and dying completely anonymously, without with virtually, if not for a few people, uh, indicating how it was the apostles did die, you'd have no way to know how they died. Because for the most part, those apostles died as, um, as being chased across the country, being chased across the globe. They died as strangers in strange lands. And so I think you, if you applied the same three ideas to the apostles, you'd have a much harder time arguing for motive than you do with Joseph Smith. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about uh, the first piece of evidence related to Mormonism and the Book of, of Mormon.
God is. Have you found Jesus yet? No. I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him, so. Are Mormons Christians? Do they believe in Jesus? Are there any differences in what they believe compared to Christians? And do these differences really matter? How can Christians share the truth with Mormon missionaries at their front door? Visit the Perception of Mormonism page at pleaseconvinceme.com to better understand what Mormons believe. Know the truth well enough to spot the counterfeit. Okay, now Christianity and Mormonism are similar in the sense that both faith systems claim to be rooted in history. You know, the Bible uh, uh, is rooted in the ancient history of the Middle East, and the Book of Mormon is rooted in the ancient history of the North American continent. At least that's what it claims. Now, both sets of scripture claim to be written by men who were eyewitnesses to the events they recorded. And both sets of scripture claim to testify about the truth of an ancient record of events. So I think for that reason, I think it's fair to submit Christian and Mormon scriptures to the same critical, evidential examination that we might use to examine other eyewitness accounts. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if Christianity is true, it ought to hold up to that examination. If, if a Mormonism is true, it should pass the evidential test of critical investigation. Now, as you know, I work cold case homicides, and I've become pretty familiar with the kind of a critical examination of evidence. I talk about it a little bit in the article I wrote about becoming a Christian case maker. If you're new to our podcast or new to our website, you can visit it at pleaseconvinceme.com. And on the gospel section, you'll see an article in the left-hand toolbar about becoming a Christian case maker. And you'll see that uh, while I would argue that we need to use good investigative techniques when examining any worldview. Now, I have applied some of those techniques, uh, techniques like forensic statement analysis to, like, for example, to the Christian Gospels. And I did that in uh, looking at the Gospel of Mark. So if you wanted to look uh, at the Gospel of Mark, uh, from my perspective, how I look at it, you can go to um, the... Uh, Bible section in, in the left-hand toolbar, you can tool down, you'll see is the Gospel of Mark um, a memoir of Peter, and you'll see how I apply these principles there. Now, I don't believe, though, after having done that with Christianity, it, I was amazed at how it stood up. I don't think, though, that Mormon scripture survives the scrutiny, this kind of scrutiny, when it's examined in a similar manner. And I think, in fact, Mormon scripture, like the Book of Abraham and what we're about to talk about today, fails the evidential test completely. So to demonstrate what I mean in this regard, I want to critically examine the evidence related to the Book of Mormon today. And here's where we're going to begin. Let's begin with the evidence that's related to the timing of the writing. What is the setting in which Joseph emerges and then claims to discover the Book of Mormon? Remember that Mormons believe that God used this humble boy, Joseph Smith, to accomplish the restoration of Christianity at a specific time in history. The timing of the work of God is of interest to us, I think, examining this, because we want to examine Joseph as an eyewitness, and the Book of Mormon as an eyewitness account. You know, why would God choose to do such a thing in the early 19th century? Why would he wait over 1,800 years to restore Christians to the truth? You know, and why would he choose a boy named Joseph Smith in Palmyra, New York? You know, maybe God just knew that it was the right time and wanted to demonstrate his power through a humble, um, seemingly incapable young man named Joseph Smith. Or, or maybe, just maybe, there were other less divine forces at work in New York at the time that Joseph emerges on the scene. So let's look at the evidence related to the location from which Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon emerge. Now, remember, as we begin this, there are several points I want you to keep in mind. Four, really, I think, in this first area of investigating the time in which Mormonism emerges. The first point is this. The Second Great Awakening had already swept through New York. Now, the famous Second Great Awakening... Um, occurred in America from about 1790 to approximately 1845. The, the first Great Awakening, the, the, this, the, the plain old Great Awakening, occurred about 50 years prior to that. 
Now, the second great awakening was really facilitated by a number of, of well-known now charismatic teachers and preachers. Uh, maybe the most famous of these is Charles Finney. And it resulted in a, a, just tremendous religious excitement throughout New England. Um, these folks were able to come in and stir up a crowd and use a, apply a particular method that was intentional with the hopes of bringing people to faith. Now, a lot could be said about Finney and his methods, but I'm not going to get into that today. All we need to know is that, that this sweeping of the Second Great Awakening through uh, the Northeast it just resulted in all this excitement in New England. It resulted uh, in all kinds of activity in the Palmyra, New York area. Uh, we know that a church attendance and conversion records um, in the area of Palmyra, New York, they reflect a really strong growth starting in about 1824. And Smith is born in this area on December 23, 1805, and he grew up in the midst of this religious revival. So you have to understand the setting. It's not as though this one boy, and even the early history as provided by the Mormon church, would affirm that Joseph grew up in this state, in this place, where there was an incredible uh, a religious fervor and revival occurring as a result of the activity of those pastors and ministers and preachers who were part of the Second Great Awakening. Keep that in your hat. The second thing you need to understand is that these guys who led the Second Great Awakening... <laughs> While they were great preachers, they sure as heck did not leave a lot in their wake in terms of guidance. Those preachers of the Second Great Awakening, they were certainly excellent communicators, and I think their camp-style revivals were designed specifically to, to get response from the people they were, were trying to reach. But the same preachers who were so good at bringing people to their knees and bringing them in on altar calls... They were much less than effective in establishing discipleship issues, you know, discipleship, discipleship processes after they converted all these people to Christianity. You know, in the wake of the revival meetings, the new converts were, for the most part, on their own, as the local church systems were just not there yet. They weren't established, they weren't planted, they weren't uh, developed well enough to help teach and mentor those who were interested in learning more about that thing they committed to last night at the revival meeting. So as a result of this, a number of unorthodox, variant, and deviant forms of Christianity em emerged in, this, in the same area in which Mormonism emerges. Mormonism is only one movement that came along as a result of this. But at the very same time, in addition to Mormonism, you have the Evangelical Christian Church in Canada, the Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, you know, that's from which you get Jehovah's Witnesses, and the Cumber Cumberland Presbyterian Church, all these different movements, church movements and religious movements, variations of Christianity, many of which are unorthodox, they all emerged at the very same time in the very same region as a result of and in response to the Second Great Awakening. So it's not as though, I mean, I would have to ask, well, why would we believe, for example, that Mormonism is the one true movement that emerged as a result of this? Why can't we look at the other movements that emerged as a result of this and say, well, maybe one of those is true? Or maybe they're all false and just the result of this great awakening that comes through and leaves very little guidance in its path. The third thing we've got to remember is the culture of the time, especially in this area, was fascinated with the origin of Native Americans. This interest in Native Americans had been developing along, among people in America really from the early 1800s. And the Native Americans of, of the Northeast were of real interest, I think, to, to settlers in that area because they were uh, there and, and, and accidentally discovering their burial grounds and burial mounds. And, and these things were being uncovered all the time by the people who were living there. And they were fascinated by the fact that some other group had settled in the area prior to the arrival of the Europeans. And there were several authors who were writing books and speculating as to the origin of Native Americans. In fact, in 1823... Ethan Smith, no relationship to Joe, he wrote a book called The View of the Hebrews. And he argued that Native Americans were actually descendants of the Hebrews from the Ten Lost Tribes. And that the, he argued that the Native Americans had migrated to North American continent after the Assyrian captivity in the 8th century B.C. A, a second edition of the book was published in 1825, five years prior to to the publication of the Book of Mormon. And as you know, that is the claim that Joseph is going to make in the Book of Mormon. Now, Ethan Smith, writing the view of the Hebrews, he wasn't alone in his speculation. I mean, there were tons of theologians at the time and believers 
who lived in that same area who speculated about the Jewish um, root or foundation of the Native Americans, you know, that, that they had come from the Hebrew clan. And Smith called these believers to restore the Native American Indians to the faith of their forefathers. Remember, that's exactly what Joseph is claiming in the Book of Mormon, that all the, 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 the Native American Indians are descended from Jews who came over the Atlantic Ocean, settled here on the North American continent, and of course he wanted to reunite them to their lost faith in Christianity. Now, the fourth principle I think you need to understand, the fourth element involved in this kind of atmosphere in which Joseph emerges is this. The people around Palmyra, the people in Northeast in New York State, uh, many people in the Northeast, many people in the Palmyra area, they were just engaged uh, almost daily in treasure digging. And this was happening in the early 19th century. It was particularly popular uh, in the um, Palmyra area where uh, Joseph Smith was raised. And there's a local paper called the Palmyra, Her Palmyra Herald and it printed some remarks I thought were very interesting. Now, at the time it prints these remarks, Joseph is about 16 years of age, and here's what it prints. Quote, Digging for money hid in the earth is a very common thing, and in this state it is even considered as honorable and profitable employment, unquote. Quote, One gentleman, uh, it goes on to say, digging 10 to 12 years, found a sufficient quantity of money to build him a commodious house. And then it goes on to describe another who dug up $50,000. So I want all of us to realize here that this practice, you know, of treasure digging, also known as money digging, it was pretty well accepted uh, by these people, and especially people in the lower economic status of the time in the Palmyra area. In fact, you know, there were a ton of diggers uh, that were known to use mystical tools to assist them in their search for treasure. As a matter of fact, in, in 1825, the Wayne Sentinel reported that treasure was being recovered with the help of what became known as a seer stone. Here's what they wrote in the uh, Wayne Sentinel. Uh, by the help of a mineral stone, which becomes transparent when placed in a hat, and the light excluded by the face of him who looks into it. So they're describing here in this article in 1825 how people are using seer stones. Now why is that important? Because of course that's what Joseph is going to use when he finds the Book of Mormon. So What's the point of all that? Well, I think if we were to stop the story right there, if we were to stop the presentation right there, is that enough reason? The motive we saw before, certainly Joseph had motive, and the fact that it doesn't seem as though uh, this, uh, this setting in which Joseph emerges is all that divine, is this enough to disqualify Joseph? You no, know, I don't think it is. But I think before we move on and look at additional pieces of evidence, we've got to stop and ask ourselves one important question. Which is more reasonable? That God used an unlikely vessel like Joseph Smith in an unlikely place like the small town of Palmyra, New York to restore Christianity to its original form or that Smith simply emerged from a region in a time that was ripe for all kinds of spiritual activity, both true and false, both legitimate and illegitimate. I think Joseph Smith, it's pretty clear, was raised in the midst of a religiously charged environment. It's not any wonder to me, at least, that someone would appear in such an environment and ultimately incorporate a lot of these other pre-existing ideas that we talked about related to Native Americans and, and take those ideas and, and incorporate them into a religious movement and, and, then, and, and then guide converts that were coming out of the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, who for the most part were lost and rudderless and, and blend them into this new religious movement. And it's not as though Mormonism appears uniquely on the scene here. You know, that there are many other religious movements that also appeared. And they are appearing in response to these circumstances and influences of the day, just as Mormonism appears to be coming out of the influences of the day. I don't think it's either surprising either that, 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 that the Mormon movement began in Palmyra. Uh, you know, and, and then, let's face it, if, if you're going to begin a movement in Palmyra, don't be surprised if it involves something that has to do with Native Americans. Don't be surprised if it has something to do with digging. Don't be surprised if it has something to do with, with seer stones. Because let's face it, those were all things that lots of folks were examining and trying to do in Palmyra, New York. So I think given what we know so far about the environment from which Mormonism emerges, if we were to stop it right here, I don't think there's any good evidential reason to accept the claims of Smith yet or accept the claims of the Book of Mormon I think I would hold my judgment if I was to stop it right here. Certainly this would give me pause for concern. 
Is this God working or just Joe along with all kinds of other folks who are coming out of the same environment trying to make the same claims? I would hold at this point. I wouldn't just jump in. But there's more, of course, and we'll get to that right after the break. Did you pay money for this? Oh, an atheist, eh? PleaseConvinceMe.com hosts a growing library of free videos and audio files designed to inspire and prepare you as ambassadors of truth. Visit our podcast page and check out the Media Archive link on the left-hand toolbar. Okay, now let's talk about evidence that's related to Joseph specifically. Now, Mormon believers, I think you know, will identify Joseph as this kind of humble, uneducated, devout young man who is simply seeking for the truth. He grows up in an environment of uh, spiritual confusion in Palmyra. And, you know, typically the LDS Church portrays Joseph as virtuous, as uh, sincere, uh, and really desiring to find out spiritual truth. And I, most of the Mormons that I know, my own family and friends, believe that, that Joseph Smith was used by God in a unique way to restore the truth to Christianity. But I'm, I would suggest that the evidence that surrounds Joseph um, is uh, important for us to look at be, because it, it, I think this, the early history of Joseph Smith provides a completely different view of who he really was. A few things I'd like to, to point out here, uh, if you're keeping uh, track of this, I would say there's three or four things here that I think are important. Three things for sure related to Joseph himself, and here they are. Number one, remember that Joseph is a local treasure digger. It, it appears from the history books, including the stuff that comes from the Mormon church, that Joseph first learned about treasure digging from a traveling magician and a diviner that visited Palmyra prior to 1825. Now, that diviner claimed to be able to locate water. He claimed to be able to locate treasure using these magic stones, and he charged $3 a day for his work. Now, he, of course, was ultimately unsuccessful in Palmyra, but when he left, Smith decided to take up the activity for himself. He assisted a number of people, uh, this is part of the history book of Mormonism, over the, uh, he assisted a number of people over the next uh, two or three years, several years really, attempting to find treasure of one sort or another. So it's not as though Joseph is in and of himself, uh, you know, aimless and jobless and just somebody looking for truth. He's actually working quite diligently uh, as a digger. Now, along the way, there's a second important issue you need to understand. That's, that's that Joseph was using a seer stone. Now, he imitated the diviner that he met when he was young by using a number of these little seer stones over the course of his entire life. And those who watched Joseph Smith use those stones, they were amazed by his claims. I'll give you an example. One such guy who watched, a guy named Joseph Capron, wrote that Smith was able to use the stone to see, quote, ghosts, infernal spirits, mountains of gold and silver, unquote. So here's Joseph working in the countryside around Palmyra, claiming to be a digger who could find treasure, who could see spirits and mountains of gold and silver using seer stones that he learned from the diviner who was previously in this community in about 1825, prior to 1825. So now combine those two things with the third fact, which I probably is most troubling, that Joseph was eventually charged with fraud for doing the very thing I've just described. Joseph, he made an attempt to collect money from people that he assisted, you know, when he was locating treasure um, and, and trying to, you know, say, I'll bring you to this treasure, I'll bring you what you're looking for, for a certain amount of money. And that activity itself landed him in trouble with a man named Josiah Stoll. This guy named Josiah Stoll hired um, Smith to assist him in uh, locating treasure that was on his property. His property was located in, in uh, eastern New York State. So Smith got, traveled east, and he brought his father with him in order to do this work. And while they were there in um, uh, eastern New York State, they stayed with a friend of Stoll. And this friend had been somebody who was going to help pay for the digging. This guy's name was Isaac Hale. 
That's important because Isaac Hale's daughter, Emma, eventually married Smith. Now, okay, after uh, they, they tried and tried and, and, and failed to find any treasure, and there was one excuse after another from Joseph Smith as to why he couldn't help find this treasure, both um, um, uh, Josiah Stoll and Isaac Hale lost all their confidence in Smith. They, they lost so much confidence, in fact, that they started to believe that Smith was trying to con them, steal from them, just kind of, you know, a, a trick them out of their money. So Stoll, later on, when in talking about this, he would recall that Smith was less than virtuous in his dealings with these two men. He said, quote, His appearance at this time was that of a careless young man, not very well educated, and very saucy and insolent to his father. Young Smith gave the money diggers great encouragement at first, but when they arrived in digging to near the place where he had stated an immense treasure would be found, he said the enchantment was so powerful that he could not see. Then they became discouraged and soon after dispersed. This took place about the 17th of November, 1825. Well, eventually, charges were filed against Joseph Smith, and he was brought to a trial in Bainbridge, New York, in March of 1826. He was charged there um, with being, a, quote, a disorderly person and an imposter, unquote. And in an account of the court proceedings that's described in Fraser's magazine, we get a glimpse of some of the details of the trial, and I'll read to you uh, that quote from Fraser's magazine. Quote, Prisoner brought before court March 20th, 1826. Prisoner examined. Says that he came from the town of Palmyra and had been at the house of Josiah Stoll in Bainbridge most of time since. Had small part of time been employed in looking for mines, but the major part had been employed by said Stoll on his farm and going to school. He had a certain stone in which he had occasionally looked at to determine where hidden treasures in the bowels of the earth were that he professed to tell this manner, his manner, this manner rather, where gold mines were a distance underground, and had looked for Mr. Stoll several times and informed him where he could find these treasures, and Mr. Stoll had been engaged in digging for them, that at Palmyra he pretended to tell by looking at this stone where coined money was buried in Pennsylvania, and while at Palmyra had frequently ascertained in that way where lost property was of various kinds, that he had occasionally been in the habit of looking through this stone to find lost property for three years, but of late had pretty much given up on it on account of his injuring his health, especially his eyes, making them sore that he did not solicit business of this kind, and had always rather declined having anything to do with this business. That's from Fraser's Magazine. It's posted in February of 1873. And there's a, also uh, a court account of this in the uh, new Schaeff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge. Now, it appears just from this, if you're looking at this thought like I am, that, that Smith was found, uh, well, first of all, I can tell you the records are hard to determine exactly what it was they convicted him of. It appears like he's found guilty of either a misdemeanor, uh, some crime in violation of the New York State vagrancy law. And that's about as far as it goes. But I think it's very important to remember that this charge of fraud was leveled at Smith when he was 20 years of age. That's about six years after Smith said he had his first vision. If you're familiar with Mormonism, you know that he at some point is going to say that he had a vision and Jesus and God the Father appeared to him. Of course, there's many variations of this vision, but one variation is such that basically in the, in the, the short script of it is that, uh, that he was told by God that there were no uh, religions that accurately represented the truth, so therefore he should start this, this, new, uh, this new movement. I've actually got an article written on all the variations of the vision accounts and exactly what Joseph said about those vision accounts and how it changed over the years in the Mormonism section of pleaseconvinceme.com. But that isn't the point. The point is that six years after supposedly being this virtuous young man who uh, simply was seeking the truth, Joseph gets arrested for a fraud case, doing exactly what it is you're going to see in a moment that he would do in discovering the Book of Mormon, or at least claim to do in discovering the Book of Mormon. So I don't think we can we can go much further. We've got to stop right here and at least assess where we are. We've got to stop and ask another important question, which is which is you know taking a look at these two possibilities. Which is more reasonable, that God used this unlikely vessel, Joseph Smith, in spite of his personal background, to restore Christianity to its original form, which is possible, or that Smith simply continued his fraudulent activity and found a way to profit from it? by saying he discovered the Book of Mormon. 
which of these two is more reasonable? I, I think, you know, the rather untrustworthy character of Joseph Smith, as demonstrated in these early years, it's often dismissed by my family, by people who are Mormons, who cite other men in the Bible who are also less than virtuous. You have a discussion about Joseph's background with anyone who's a devout Mormon, they're eventually going to say things like, hey, you know, look at David's life. He wasn't always so great. Look at Paul. He was chasing down Christians. But I think unlike the biblical examples that are cited sometimes by Mormons, Joseph Smith was still involved in fraudulent activity at the very time that he was making important claims related to the discovery of the Golden Plains. It's one thing to have a person from the Old Testament or New Testament be described as transformed after having a first-hand encounter with God. It's another thing to demonstrate to, to have a person like Joseph, who after having the vision, six years later is still involved in criminal activity, which is precisely the same activity he's going to say he used to find the Book of Mormon. Big difference. I think given what we know so far about the character and the history of Joseph Smith, there's still no good evidential reason to accept the claims of Smith or to accept the claims of the Book of Mormon. Would I, at this point, throw out, did I at this point even investigating this say, okay, it's false? Not yet. I didn't. <laughs> I still thought, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm just saying it's certainly more reasonable to see this as a charlatan than to see this as a prophet, but I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt at least this far. Let's just go a little further. Let's now take a look at the evidence related to the translation process. Because remember that Joseph claimed to retrieve golden plates that were buried in the ground near Palmyra. And he eventually translated these plates into what became the Book of Mormon. And I think really few Mormon believers actually understand the manner in which those plates got translated. But the evidence that I'm going to share with you today, it's going to help you to understand if the plates are truly uh, what they say they were, if they existed at all, if they were translated at all, and if in fact any of that is an act of God. So let's take a look at um, what I would look at as maybe, oh, I've written it out here, three or so important areas to consider when looking at the evidence related to the translation process. First, remember that no one ever observed the plates with their natural eyes. You've got to begin by understanding that while Smith claimed to discover uh, a very large, heavy set of plates, and I think that Bill McKeever does a great job of illustrating the weight of these at various um, uh, uh, events around the country, uh, these these plates are uh, really estimated to weigh over 200 pounds. Well, none of the people who helped him translate the plates, uh, they never actually appear to have seen the plates with their own eyes. Yet when Smith moves uh, to Pennsylvania with his wife Emma in October of 1827, they brought a wooden box that Smith said contained the plates. And they stayed with Emma's parents at the time. But But Joseph refused to show Emma or her parents the plates. And as a result, Emma's father refused to let Joseph store the box in the house. So what did Joseph do? He, he, he hid the box in the surrounding woods, he said at least. And he claimed that he could translate the plates without having to have them physically present. So that hidden location, it didn't really slow down his ability to translate the Book of Mormon. Now, several people assisted Joseph in this translation process. And the history of Mormonism accounts for these folks and that includes Emma, uh, Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, which was actually Smith's third cousin, and David Whitmer. But it appears that none of these folks actually had seen the plates during the process. In April of 1828, Martin Harris's wife became suspicious of the fact that her husband, Martin, had not yet seen the plates, and she demanded to see them. And Smith once again refused. It ultimately led to a, a loss of 116 pages of the original, original transcript. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But, but what's important here is to know that, that Martin Harris ultimately demanded to see those plates in March of 1829. And that was many months into the translation process. Understand that during those months he still hadn't seen the plates. He, had, he was yet to see what he was supposedly helping to translate. So Smith told Harris that, that quote, he would go into the wood where the book of plates was, and that after he came back, Harris should follow his tracks in the snow and find the book and examine it for himself. So Harris attempted to do that, and he never found the plates, just as Joseph, uh, you know, he told him where to go. He had the footprints and everything, but he tried it, and he couldn't find the plates. Then the next day, Smith, coincidentally, 
uh, you know, he's dictating the next day uh, after uh, Martin is unable to find this, the golden plates, and he dictates a portion of the golden plates that said that Harris would eventually qualify to be one of three witnesses who would eventually see the plates. So clearly, even from this point, by his own admission, Smith is admitting that no one has yet seen the plates. It's clear from the history of Mormonism that Joseph supposedly finds the plates, supposedly moves the plates, supposedly begins to translate the plates, yet nobody gets a chance to see the plates. Uh, well, this, pro this prophecy I told you about uh, for Martin, it did seem to pacify him for a time. And, but by June of, of 1829, Smith finally had to leave the town where he was staying with Emma's parents. And, and local residents there were really becoming suspicious about him and, and about his activity about these plates, about all of it. So Joseph left town. He lived with David Whitmer and his parents in Fayette, New York. Now, now Smith said that the angel Moroni transported the plates to this new location and placed them in the Whitmer family garden. So nobody ever saw him move the plates. He simply said it was done by an angel. And, and Joseph completed the translation at the Whitmer home. Now, while he was there, um, Martin Harris, Whitmer, and Cowdery, they all three started to press him to see the plates and Joseph told them that they would have to rely on God's word. And if they did that, with a full purpose of heart, they would have, quote, a view of the plates, and also the breastplate, the sword of Laban, the uh, Urim and the Thummim, and the miraculous directors which were given to Lehi. In other words, Cliff's, I mean, um, Smith is telling these three men that they're going to see not only the plates, but all this other stuff, if their faith was strong. Well, okay, these three guys then went out into the woods with Smith. Um, they stopped at some point. Uh, they began to pray. This is all according to the, to the history that's recorded by the church, according to Joseph Smith's history of the church. And they stopped and prayed there, and, the, and when the plates, guess what, they weren't revealed, they began to pray harder. And when that did not help, uh, Martin Harris offered to leave the group because he was worried that, you know, his own doubt was the reason the, pl the, the plates were not being revealed. So as soon as he leaves, what happens? The remaining two um, men who were there with, with, with Smith, they claim to have a vision of an angel and the plates, but not the other items that Joseph had promised, just an angel and the plates. So Smith left those men and went and found Harris and told Harris about their visions. And, and, and Harris prayed again with Smith and Harris. And eventually, uh, you know, he's, he's getting, Martin's at the point where he's at his wit's end. And he eventually he cries out, quote, according to Joseph Smith now in his history of the church, eventually Martin uh, with Smith yells out, tis enough, tis enough, mine eyes have beheld, mine eyes have beheld. Now, I hope you understand that the Mormon church portrays those first three witnesses as critical. They're trustworthy, they're reliable. Uh, they're listed in the front of the Book of Mormon, but history seems to indicate something completely different. Uh, you know, you see, if you open your Book of Mormon, there's, there's a, a, a page in the very front that, that has the testimony of the three witnesses. They're seen as like the, th the, the people who are so essentially important, because just as the apostles saw the risen Christ, these men are said to have seen the plates. But if you look at the, the truth of the matter, you'll, you'll realize that Oliver Cowdery, for example, he was eventually excommunicated from the church. And he was excommunicated because he, I think, well, the history seems to indicate that because he exposed Smith's first polygamous relationship to, uh, you know, he was having a relationship with a woman named Fanny Alger. And uh, as a result of exposing him, he was excommunicated. And Smith described him as a, a thief, a liar, a perjurer, a counterfeiter, an adulterer, and a leader of, quote, scoundrels of the deepest degree, unquote. And, and Cowdery, this integral, supposedly virtuous first witness, he later became a Methodist, and he denied the Book of Mormon altogether, and he publicly confessed his, quote, sorrow and shame, unquote, for having any connection with Mormonism. How about the second, uh, Martin Harris? We talked about him quite a bit. Well, he was a member of five different religious groups before becoming a Mormon, and he was a part of eight different religious groups after leaving Mormonism. He was also excommunicated from the Mormon church. And he later reported that he did not see the plates as Smith described, but only saw the plates three days after Cowdery and Whitmer, and then only in a spiritual sense. Here's what he says, according to Anthony Metcalf. 
Quote, I never saw the golden plates, only a visionary or entranced state, only in a visionary or entranced state. In about three days, I went into the woods to pray that I might see the plates. And while praying, I passed into a state of entrancement. And in that state, I saw the angel and the plates. Now, David Whitmer, the third guy involved in this vision in the, in the woods, he was also excommunicated from the church and later declared that he was himself a prophet of the new church of Christ. Now, Joseph called this guy, uh, David Whitmer, uh, quote, dumb beast to ride, unquote, and, quote, and asked to bray, about cur- uh, to bray out cursings instead of blessings, unquote. Whitmer later uh, uh, admitted that he saw those plates, quote, by the eye of faith, unquote, rather than with his physical eyes. And he waffled between um, two or three varying accounts of how he saw the plates. Now, eventually Smith decided that this group of three witnesses was insufficient. He, he involved another additional eight men and recruited them as potential eyewitnesses. And he formed a group of 11 total witnesses to the Golden Plates. Now, it's interesting to note that, limited, uh, that Smith limited his, 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 his choices. His selection of these 11 men were simply limited to those who were very close friends or relatives. He, he first involved four brothers of David Whitmer. Then he recruited his own father, two of his own brothers, and Hiram Page, who was married to David Whitmer's sister, Catherine. Now, even though Smith limited his choices to close friends and relatives, these men also had trouble staying true to the faith, founded on the golden plates that they claimed to see. Two of these eight guys apostatized and left the church altogether. Another was excommunicated. Of the 11 men who claimed to see the golden plates, only five remained faithful to Mormonism. Three of these five men were blood relatives of Joseph Smith. Martin Harris later reported that these additional eight witnesses also observed the plates in a vision and never saw the plates with their natural eyes. After the translation of the plates, Smith claimed that they were returned to the angel and were no longer available for examination. So, so that's why now there's no other witnesses who were ever able to authenticate the golden plates, and there's no way for us to authenticate the golden plates. That's the first and foremost issue related to the translation process that you need to get your hands around. But there's another one. Joseph translated those plates exactly as he searched for treasure. Most modern accounts of Smith's translation process, they depict him reading from the plates. You know, if you see a picture um, of Joseph translating, this is what it's going to look like. Joseph's sitting at a table. He's looking at the plates. He's uh, looking closely at them. And then you've got Martin Harris or somebody else on the other side of the table who is listening to what he is saying that the plates say. And this other person is then scribing it down on paper. You see this illustration all the time. But that could not be further from the truth, according to those who were involved in the translation process. It never happened that way. Never. In that version, if that was true, it would be great because both sides would have access to the plates, right? Both could look at it. The person who's doing the transcribing could look across the table and see Joseph going character to character. and trans. It never happened that way. I'll, I'll tell you what the real translation process was. It's very different according to those who saw it. Let's just quote those who saw it. Emma Smith said, quote, In writing for your father, I frequently wrote day after day, often sitting at a table close by him. He's sitting with his face buried in his hat and the stone in it and dictating hour after hour with nothing between us. You notice there's no plates in this description. Just Joseph in a room with his head and in a hat looking at a cedar stone. David Whitmer said, quote, I will now give you a description of the manner in which the Book of Mormon was translated. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling a parchment would appear. And on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear. And under it was an interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe. And when it was written down and repeated to brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear, and another character with interpretation would appear. Thus, the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God, and not by any power of man. He also later said, I, as well as all of my father's family, Smith's wife, Oliver Cowdery, and Martin Harris, were present during the translation. He, meaning Joseph Smith, did not use the plates in translation. 
So once again, we've got a description, but Joseph is not sitting down at the table with the plates. Nobody else gets to see those plates, and he's not even near the plates as he's translating. Martin Harris said, quote, uh, well, he's, he's quoted as, as saying, um, and when he's talking about an incident that occurred during the time that he wrote the, uh, the portion of the translation of the Book of Mormon, where he's favored to, to write direct from the mouth of the prophet uh, Joseph Smith, he said that the prophet possessed a seer stone by which he was enabled to translate as well as from the Urim and Thummim, and, and for convenience he then used the seer stone. He, he, this is how Martin explained the translation as occurring. By aid of the seer stone, sentences would appear and were read by the prophet and written by Martin uh, himself, and when finished, he would say, written. And if correctly written, that sentence would disappear, another would appear in its place. But if not correctly written, it remained until corrected. So the translation was just as it was engraven on the plates, precisely in the language then used. And all of this is being done without the plates present. Now, Oliver Cowdery said this, quote, These were days never to be forgotten. To sit under the sound of a voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven awakened the utmost gratitude of this bosom. Day after day I continued, uninterrupted, to write from his mouth, as he translated with the Urim and Thummim, uh, or, as the Nephites would have said, interpreters, the history or record called, quote, the Book of Mormon, unquote. Uh, Isaac Hale, that's Emma's father, he was a little bit less uh, uh, convinced of this process. He wrote, quote, The manner in which he pretended to read and interpret was the same as when he looked in the, uh, for the money diggers, with a stone in his hat and his hat over his face, while the book of plates were at the same time hid in the woods, unquote. So he's complaining, basically, that Joseph is doing this while he's supposedly all these book of plates is actually in the backyard. Now, uh, Emma had a brother-in-law uh, named uh, Michael Morse. He, he wrote this, quote, When Joseph was translating the Book of Mormon, I had occasion more than once to go into his immediate presence and saw him engaged at his work of translation. The mode of procedure consisted in Joseph's placing the seer stone in the crown of a hat, then putting his face into the hat so as to entirely cover his face, resting his elbows upon his knees, and then dictating word after word while the scribes, Emma, John Whitmer, O. Cowdery, or some other, wrote it down. Unquote. And, and finally, uh, Joseph uh, had a, uh, a friend whose name was uh, Joseph Knight. And he wrote, quote, Now the way he translated was, he put the Urim and Thummim into his hat and darkened his eyes, and he would take out a sentence and it would appear in bright Roman letters, and then he would tell the writer and he would write it that uh, then that would go away, and the next sentence would come, and so on. And, but if it was not spelt right, it would not go away until it was right. So we see it was marvelous. Thus the whole translated. Unquote. So I think you can see from these statements of the eyewitnesses, it's pretty clear that, that Smith's relying... Um, not on the plates, they're not even in the same room. He's relying on the hat and the seer stone, and those plates stayed hidden throughout the entire process. And that, I think, explains why so many people became suspicious over the course of the translation. It's also, I think, interesting that, that Joseph relies on what he knows best. He, he, he has an experience as a treasure digger, and he brings all those tools into this translation process. That translation process was identical to the way he uh, previously claimed he was searching for buried treasure. And one thing we know for sure is that those efforts to dig out treasure were often unsuccessful and were found fraudulent by a court of law. Let's just talk about one last piece of this translation process I think is important. Remember how before I said that Martin uh, Harris, was, his wife was suspicious and wanted to see the plates? Well, his wife's name was Lucy. And eventually, um, she uh, actually exposed, I think, if they had seen it coming early, they could have seen this in hindsight for sure, it's obvious. But the third point I'm trying to make here is that Joseph is not able to reproduce 116 pages of translation that he actually produced because Lucy got involved, Martin Harris's wife, in a way that I think helps us evidentially in hindsight. Uh, she um, really it was actually an early believer in this whole process, and she supported Smith. I mean, she even financed the translation with some of her own money, and, and she repeatedly asked to see those plates, but Smith always denied her. And Joseph told him, I'm not going to show it to you. As a matter of fact, he says some pretty bad things about her as a result of her asking all the time. And, and so she eventually suspected that Joseph was trying to defraud Martin. So she confronted Martin, and she, and she told him about this. And, and then on a visit to Joseph Smith's house, Lucy actually attempts to locate the plates. And she's searching around his house and all of his property, and she's not able to locate them. So 
Uh, Joseph then, when, she found, when he found out about this, claimed that he did not need the plates to be present in order to translate them. And he always maintained that the plates were hidden in the woods where Lucy would not find them anyway. Well, from April to June of 1828, Martin was working as Joseph's scribe. And, and Joseph dictated about 116 pages of the manuscript for the Book of Mormon to Harris during that time. Now, Martin was beginning to have these serious doubts about the authenticity of the work based on what Lucy was nagging at him about. And he told uh, Joseph Smith about Lucy's concerns, and, and he asked Joseph to, to allow him to take 116 pages back home to show his wife so that her concerns would be answered. Well, of course, Joseph refused the request. As a matter of fact, he refused it two times, but ultimately he did allow Harris to take the manuscript home, the translation. Well, of course, while he's at the home, at Harris's house, the transcript disappears. Eventually, Harris has to kind of humbly go back to Joseph Smith and tell him that the, the 116 pages had been lost. Now, what's interesting, of course, is Joseph is in a panic, but I, what I think is interesting is that Joseph refused to simply retranslate the lost pages. That would have been a perfect, uh, for me at least, if he had been able to word for word translate those, and if later on they had been found and they were still the same two times in a row, I think we'd have good direct physical evidence that this translation is probably, it, you know, there, there was a Book of Mormon in plate form that existed from which this translation came. But here's what Smith does instead. He refuses to retranslate it. And he claims that evil men might alter the original manuscript, if it's ever found, in an effort to discredit him. So he says that, hey, God is gonna, has already given me another direction here. He's told me to replace the lost material with another account of the same events by another Book of Mormon character named Nephi. So Smith basically says that God knew that, this would, uh, that the theft would occur in advance, and therefore he prepared a very similar history of events in the small plates of Nephi, which were also part of the Book of Mormon plates. And so he tells Martin, hey, don't worry about those. We're going to let those go. We're going to start over again and do it all over again. The summary will not match the original because it's not going to be translated from the original. Now, the fact that Smith refused to try to reproduce the original 106 pages for me as a detective gives me great suspicion. But it, I'm not alone. It caused a lot of suspicion even back then. And from the very beginning, Lucy Harris, for example, I mean, it's quite possible that Lucy stole those 116 pages just to test Smith, because later on she said, quote, If this be a divine communication, the same being who revealed it to you can easily replace it, unquote. So I'm wondering if, if Lucy's just not trying to test him, but regardless, he avoided the test by making this claim that he would translate a different set of plates. So if we stop right here for our podcast today, and we're running long, but we'll stop right here. But let's just stop and look at the uh, case we've laid out so far. Um, which is more reasonable? That Smith translated real plates utilizing the power of God, or that Smith simply recited the Book of Mormon without any reference to the plates at all? I think Mormon history confirms how this happened, that Smith carefully hid the golden plates from those who wanted to see them, he hid them from those who wanted to verify what he was doing. He translated the plates not from a visual um, examination of the plates, of the writing on the plates, but rather from a mystical practice that he had learned as a digger several years prior to this. And, and when a portion of the translation is lost, guess what? Joseph is unable to duplicate it. I mean, given what we know so far about the manner in which the plates were translated, I still think there's no evidential reason to accept the claims of Smith or the Book of Mormon. As a matter of fact, if you're not starting to become suspicious at this point, something's wrong. Everything here should be sending up red flags. Now, there's a lot more to talk about, and I think a deal sealer is coming. The one thing that then prevented me from ever stepping off, because... All we can say about this so far, ladies and gentlemen, is this is good circumstantial evidence. Circumstantially, it appears that Joseph is probably more likely a fraud than a prophet, given what we know so far. But it's only circumstantial. It just turns out, though, that this case is more than circumstantial. It also involves several pieces, or at least one important piece, of direct physical evidence that demonstrates he's lying. And we're going to talk about all of that next week. I hope this podcast today as long as it's gone, has, has kind of begun to be helpful for you in seeing the evidential nature of the Book of Mormon. Uh, 
This is the case that I would like to make to everybody, but of course you don't get a chance to do that when you're standing on a street corner talking to your friend at the library, talking in a workplace. So I typically rely on that one piece of good direct physical evidence when I'm trying to relate this quickly to somebody rather than go through all of this circumstantial evidence. But I want to give you all of it so you're aware of all of it so you'll know uh, how to respond when somebody makes a claim like this. But in the end, we will talk about one piece of direct physical evidence that I think is the deal killer. So, I hope this has been helpful for you guys as you examine Mormonism. I, don't, I haven't seen much material on the evidential approach to, to this yet online, so this is maybe a, a chance for some of you to hear these kinds of details for the first time. And I hope that has been uh, helpful uh, as we go forward. Looking forward to talking to you next week. We'll finish this up. We'll do two podcasts on the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith. And we'll do that again next week right here on the Please Convince Me 